Merry Christmas, Catalyst. Let's go ahead and get to your feet. We're going to start by singing Joy to the World. I'm so happy to see you all here this morning. Oh, Jesus, we praise you today, Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is coming. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. so much that we have so much joy this morning coming together families from maybe out of town coming to visit we're so thankful for all the new people that are in the room and the people who have come year in and year out to celebrate your birth Jesus Lord I just pray a blessing over this morning over the message and over every heart that walked into this room let them be filled with hope and love and peace as they're sent out after service. We love you so much, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. 
Welcome to Catalyst Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Fozzie, and we are just excited to have you here this Christmas season. They call me Scrooge around here, but I don't agree with them. I know, right? I might look like. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, we're we are excited to have you here and worshiping with us today. Um, we'd also love to invite you to download our app. We have all kinds of information on our app. Just go to any app store, type in Catalyst Woodland. You'll find it. It's free. They've got all kinds of sermon notes, previous sermons, different kind of information, and we're constantly updating it. So please download it, check it out. Um, If you are new here, um, we would love for you to grab one of these Connect cards. They should be in the seat backs in front of you. Fill this out and either drop it in the black boxes or stop by the info bar um, because we have a gift for you guys. If you are new, Fill it out. Stop by the info bar. We have a gift for you guys. It's awesome. It's just a thank you to say, you know, thank you for coming and joining us in worship today. Um, Thirdly, if you give, we are truly thankful for that. Um, We would not be able to do the ministry that we do without your giving, without your tithing and your offerings to God. Um, And if you don't give or you haven't given, we'd love to encourage you to take that opportunity to worship God in that unique way. Um, God calls for us to honor him and trust him with our finances. And so we do that day in and day out, year in and year out. And so we'd love to encourage you guys, if you haven't ever given or haven't given, we'd love to encourage you guys, stop by catalystwoodland.com slash give. You can give a one time, you can give reoccurring, anything like that. Um, also, next week, we will not be here. All right? We have church on the couch, which just sounds uber comfortable. Um, so church on the couch next week, if you show up here, it will be dark and cold because we won't turn the heater on. Um, but join us online church on the couch, 9am. We will be united in spirit together, worshiping God. Um, <clears throat> so our website or church on the couch.com. And then finally, we have an amazing new series coming up called real change. Um, it is something that screams my heart. It's going to be about discipleship spiritual disciplines, um, growth towards God, and this understanding of of worship towards God. And so we'd really encourage you guys, come during the new year. I think the first Sunday is the second, and it'll be an amazing series to walk through and march through and see how we can continue to grow closer to God, but also draw others closer to God. So check out this clip real quick. which quickly turns into reflection and a long list of resolutions. Lose weight, work out, read more, slow down, eat better. Unfortunately, by mid-year, most of us find ourselves back at square one. What if there was a better way? What would this year look like if instead of a fad diet, we took a deeper look at some of the things that are happening within each and every one of us? Maybe, just maybe, this could be a year of real change. There we go. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is good to have you with us. Merry Christmas. Welcome. Um, I wanted to just uh, take a few moments uh, before we really got going and uh, talk to you about Give Love and just give you a little bit of an update of what happened throughout this year with Give Love. If you don't know what Give Love is, Give Love is our initiative. Uh, to serve and care for the foster youth of Yolo County. It began a number of years ago and has had several iterations throughout the years. Um, But this year, our biggest challenge was to provide the Christmas wish of every foster child in Yolo County, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gifts. So we came out and made that announcement on uh, November 5th, I think it was, and we launched that initiative, and y'all did it in two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, praise God for that. So uh, we were in a bit of a pickle because uh, we had all these people who wanted to be a part and uh, get involved with what was happening around here with Give Love. And so uh, we went back and uh, did these things, these bags, which we call uh, emergency bags or Give Love bags. And the goal with these is when a child is removed from wherever they are into foster care, they really don't have much. They usually come with just 
what they have on their back. And so uh, we create these backpacks and fill it full of stuff to uh, provide for everything a foster child needs in their first 24 to 48 hours. And we were like, man, this would be so awesome if we were able to do 100 bags. And I was like, yeah. And so you did that in a week. Um, And so then we came back and we were like, we're just going to keep going. And so as of today, we still have some more cards out there and we'll be running it through Christmas. But as of today, uh, you all have done 425 gifts and 225 backpacks, which is uh, absolutely amazing and uh, incredible. So thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for being a part of that. And so we have a quick video that we wanted to show you of just kind of how it went down if, uh, as we kind of brought it to the end and would love you to take a watch. So check it out. Amen. That was amazing to see how the whole community just kind of gathers together and, and, and honors what God has called us to do, to love uh, the unlovable, to love those who are in need. And so um, today we are actually going to um, do something that's not normal for Catalyst. We are going to kind of step back in time. Um, we are going to practice something that has been done through thousands of years of church history, um, where we are going to read scripture together. And we're going to honor God through doing it. Um, because the old church, in the ancient times, they didn't have Bibles to transmit the way that we have them. Um, we, we, we had to gather together and had to have one person read the word of God. And in doing so, what they would do is they would stand. And they would all listen and just kind of dwell in the word of God being read over top of them. And so that's what we're going to do today. Here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand as I read some scripture. And then afterwards, we'll sit and, and have a prayer that, that comes from what's called the Common Book of Prayer. It was written in the 1700s, and it's, it's three prayers that are combined together during the Advent season that have been pr- prayed for over 300 years. 
And so we're going to kind of join as, as one unified church through, through kind of church history throughout time to honor God together, to kind of step back to our roots and just trust in who God is, worship him for what he has given us, and to honor Christ and the sacrifice that was made. And so if you wouldn't mind, please stand with me. And if you can't stand, that is quite all right. Um, but we're going to stand and just honor God's word as I read it today. I'm going to be reading from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. If you wouldn't mind being seated, as I read this Advent prayer that has been read throughout church history for hundreds of years, just meditate with me on this, to, to, to just pray in spirit these words along with me. O oh God, who makes us glad about the yearly remembrance of the birth of the one and only Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as we joyfully receive him for our Redeemer, so we may with sure confidence receive him when he comes to be our judge. He who lives and reigns with God and the Holy Spirit as one God without end. O oh God, who has caused this holy night to shine with the illumination of the true light. Grant us that we have known the mystery of that light upon the earth, so we may also perfectly enjoy him in heaven, where with God and the Holy Spirit he lives and reigns as one God in glorious everlasting life. Almighty God, who has given us our only begotten Son, to take on our nature, and at this time to be born of a virgin. God, grant that we, being made new and adopted as your own children in grace, may we daily be renewed by your Holy Spirit. Through the same Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the same Spirit forever, one God, without end. Amen. So I know that uh, over the years, um, I've given a lot of grief to kids who have cell phones, because um, I, I don't think you should own a cell phone until you're at least like, you know, mature enough to handle it. I don't know, maybe 25, we'll see. Um, and so um, I, I've been adamant about this in our household. I, I don't care how old you are. Like we, we will, I will consider it at 16. That's what I've told them. I will, I will open up the conversation and consider it at 16. Well, they wore me down. <clears throat> and because I tell you, preteens are relentless. 
and they won't stop. And so he's just, we need a phone, we need a phone. They're making up all these ridiculous reasons of why they need a phone. But then it actually came to um, a, a fairly powerful and compelling uh, set of evidence of why they needed a phone. And so, um, you know, if, if a kid can have fun while they're persuading their parents, then a parent can have fun when giving a gift, right? Because that's the joy of the season, blah, blah, blah. So um, I... Tell my son, I, I, we told all of them, but I, I told the oldest because he was the most, um, we'll call it forthright, um, about, about it. And I said, hey man, so here's the deal. Um, you've made a, a compelling case to your mom and dad because um, you are home alone, watch your brothers, you go to the store to pick stuff up, like you're, you're doing responsible things and we want you to be responsible and do those things. But we also realize we live in a world where you know, you may need to get a hold of us because we're at work or we're out or whatever. So um, we're, we're going to get you a phone. And he's like, what? No way. Yes. Right. He's so excited. He's like, which one? Are we, uh, are we getting like an iPhone 13 Pro? And I'm like, okay. I like, or like, you know, whatever Galaxy's got going on. Um, and I was like, I, you know, I don't know. Like, you'll, we will just have to wait and see. And so uh, my wife and I go on, we order the phone, and it is phone delivery day, right? So the phone arrives, and um, I told him, I mean, you, you got to really build it up. And so I told him before he left for school, I was like, hey, man, the phone's coming today while you're at school. It'll be here on the kitchen table when you get home. He's like, yes, 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 right? So uh, I, of course, wanted to be home, so I left work a little early. I was there at home, and he comes home, and he's like, where is it? Where is it? We're like, it's a box on the kitchen table. And he's like, yeah. So he walks over and opens a cool pad 22. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, pretty cool, right? Do you, cool pad, yeah, cool pad, bros. <laughs> you, you and my 12-year-old, he'll be so pumped to know that. I'll be like, dude, you're great, he has your phone. You're so cool. Um, so anyway, um, so you're probably wondering the very thing he asked me. What does it do? And I'm like, all right, bro, you ready? It's crazy. It makes phone calls. And he was like, what else? I'm like, that's it. It's a phone. What else do you want it to do? Here, take it. Shut up. Walk away. And so um, he was not thrilled um, and uh, is not real excited about the CoolPad 22, uh, nearly as excited as <laughs> his uh, mother and I were to watch him go through that. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I promise I, I wouldn't show. We did, we, we set up, because everything. I got a mug from my folks last night that said, be careful or you might end up in a sermon. Um, and, and so I, I have, um, like we record everything in our house. And so of course I have a video of him like real high, real low, low, and that's embarrassing. And I want him to have a decent childhood. So I, I promise I wouldn't share it with you all. But, um, but as he was leaving in angst, um, as teens do, he said something uh, that he later regretted, but it, it, was, it was important to the point of, of what, where I'm going this morning. He said, I knew I couldn't trust you to get me a phone, as if like, like we did it on accident. We're like, let's see, iPad, that one. Oh, we selected the wrong one, like as if it was an accident. No, this phone was very intentional. Um, but when he said that to me, it, it got me thinking just about life and how early we learn to doubt people when they tell us certain things, right? We, it's like, ah, I, I don't know if I can fully believe you. I, I'm not quite sure. And then, and if you've been with us for any length of time, if you haven't, if you're here for Christmas or just checking it out or watching online or whatever, um, we've been through this whole series over the last several weeks where we've been talking about the whole idea between truth and lies and doubt and how do you decipher and how do you understand and, and really... We, we didn't actually get into doubt. We talked about truth and lies and how do you tell the difference, but we didn't get into the whole concept or idea about doubt. What happens when you hear something and your gut instinct is to doubt? I want to talk about that today. And, so, and if you're thinking, really, like Christmas, you want to run with doubt? I do. Uh, because it matters and it is important. And we can go through this Christmas season and just kind of gloss over everything. Yay, you know, put a bow on it. And aren't we glad that, you know, 2022 or 2021, we're all gathered in a room. Last year was online. Yay. And, and just kind of miss 
that we can very easily doubt and kind of live in a place of doubt for most of our life. And then, and if you were raised in the church or have any experience in the church or met a Christian once, um, and, and you were pitched faith in any kind of regard, what you were told was, if you have faith, you're not allowed to have doubt. That doubt and faith are incompatible. You, can't, you cannot doubt. Don't doubt. And especially don't doubt Jesus. You just, you just follow. And if you had that conversation with someone when you were older or you experienced doubt and you were of thinking age, you probably thought the same thing I did. Really? Don't doubt? Like, as if I have a choice. Right? I don't know about you. For me, doubt, I don't go looking for doubt. Doubt tends to find me. Right? Like, it just happens. I don't think to myself, you know what? I'm going to doubt that. Right? It just, I just end up doubting. I find myself in a place of doubt. It's, it's very similar to any other kind of mental health or emotional thing that you have. Like, right? I, I don't choose to have anxiety over something. Anxiety just kind of happens. In the same kind of way, doubt just kind of happens. You come to this place where suddenly you're realizing, man, I'm doubting so much in my life. I don't understand what's really going on. I'm doubting everything I've ever been told. I've been doubting what I've been considering news or trustworthy source or my mom or my dad or my best friend who promised they wouldn't go anywhere. I just, and then it's really hard not to just lay that on top of God and just say, you know what? I doubt everything in my life, but I blindly trust God. And if we can be honest and adult enough, like at some point you end up doubting. And if you haven't doubted, good for you. I'd love to meet you. Um, I, but I've, I've never met that person. And so when we doubt, two things happen. We ask two questions. I'll, I'll phrase it that way. Um, and, and they tend to go in order of age. We ask, is it, is it true? Is it worth it? Is it true? Is it worth it? Is it true? Is it worth it? When you're younger, usually it's the, is it true? Is it true? Did my dad really buy me a cool pad 22? Yes, son, that is true. Is it worth it? No, TBD. Um, is it true? Is it worth it, right? So when you're a kid and you get told something, there is an element of where you go, well, hold on. Is that, is that true? Are you lying to me? Are you, are, are, is that really true? I'm not sure about that. But then when you get older, you begin to kind of learn, you get a sense for what is true and what isn't. And you kind of, by the time you hit 25 to 30, you've kind of drawn your line in the sand of what generally things are true and what generally things are false. So then it goes to number two, is it worth it? It may be true, but is it worth it? God may be God, but is it worth it to follow him? This may be worth it to stick it in this marriage, or it may be true, it may be true to be a good thing to stay with your marriage, but is it worth it? It may be true to work hard and get everything I can to my employer as a representation of what I do before God, but is it worth it? Is it true? Is it worth it? And those seasons of doubt come up. One of the cleanest rhyming, which is why I can remember it, phrases I've ever heard, is we doubt when we think it won't work out. All right, so when do you doubt? You doubt when you think it won't work out. I don't know if this is going to work out. I don't know if that's really true. I don't know if that's actually what he meant to say. I don't know if she's really going to hold up on that promise. I don't know. I don't know. And so I want to look at the Christmas story as one does on this day. Um, but I want to look through a different lens. I want to look through a lens of doubt. And what I think you're going to find is quite shockingly, there's actually way more doubt in this story than we think. Because as you should, everyone focuses on the baby Jesus. Um, and yes, he is the focal point. But if you look at everyone around him and watch their reactions, you actually begin to find everyone's initial emotional reaction is doubt. Every single one of them. Even his mom. We'll, watch, we'll see that in a second. So, um, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 1. I'm actually uh, picking right up where Pastor Fozzie left off last week. He did a great job of walking through the first part of Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to keep going with that. If you don't have a Bible and want one, we have uh, small stacks at either exit or entrance. Uh, you know, if you're a glass half full or half empty kind of person. Um, and so you can grab one. If you don't own one, take it with you. It's our gift to you. Or you can open up on any app or they will be up on the screen to my left or right, or if you're watching or listening online, they will magically appear right about here. So, uh, was I pretty close? Yeah, awesome. All right, um, let's pray, and then, and then we'll read together. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much um, 
for today. And uh, God, just everything that uh, you're going to do in this place um, through your word that was written so long ago with the sole intent of elevating the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who we gather to celebrate this day. So God, would you illuminate things that we've never seen before to inspire our faith in spite of our doubt. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, church, we ready to go to work? Here we go. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Here we go. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or been uh, prearranged marriage to Joseph, before they came together, wink, wink, that means exactly what you think it means. Um, They didn't want to be like, never mind. Uh, Got kids in the room. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Uh oh. And her husband Joseph, being just a man, being just a dude, that's important. It says that being just just an ordinary dude. And he was unwilling to put her to shame, which was exceptionally rare for that culture. We'll talk about that in a minute. He resolved to divorce her quietly. Right. So he hears through a variety of sources. We'll see in a minute that his wife is pregnant and. He was like, mm, I, I would certainly remember that, um, and I don't, so, and she's like, no, 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 it's totally cool. It's a God baby, and he was like, right. Um, all right, anyway, um, the law says I get to divorce you. Um, the law, actually, if you, if you really went to the nth degree, once she had the baby, and it was proof that she had slept with someone else, um, he could kill her legally, but he just, the, the law said he could just divorce her, and so he's like, look, Mary, I love you. I, I really respect you, and so we'll just kind of do this under the radar. We'll just go. We'll file the papers. We'll talk to your dad and be like, hey, you got to find another suitor because it ain't going to be me, um, and I'll just go talk to my parents. They'll find me another wife, and we'll just, we'll just kind of let it be, um, and so a very honorable and respectable thing for him to do, and so verse 20, the beginning, but as he considered these things, so He had something he had decided to do, but then he paused, then he thought, then he considered. Is it true? Is it worth it? Is it true? Is it worth it? I have my doubts. Is it true? Is it worth it? And don't you know that sometimes your gut instinct is not God's will? Right? That sometimes the thing you want to do more than anything is not what actually God has for you. The thing that your heart says, do this, or your best friend says, do this, or your employer says, do this, God says, "Ah, I wouldn't do that. I would just, just, just wait. So luckily he does. The verse continues. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which she, that, sorry, which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So this angel shows up, and speaks completely contrary to logic, right? The, the one thing that Joseph is probably expecting from this angel dream situation is, A, she cheated on you, you need to leave her, be done with it, but that's not what he says. He says, hey, what is in her is from me, stick with it. And we'll explain all of this in a minute because it's really powerful what happens. So continuing on. All of this took place, and that, that has more meaning than we could ever imagine. All of this, what he's referring to when he says all of this, is all of the things that happened with the virgin birth and the speaking of the angel and the prophecy. He is referencing hundreds of prophecies in that one statement. All of this, not just the conversation between Joseph and Mary. He's going back hundreds of years to all of these prophecies when he says all of this took place. All of this took place, meaning it's not random, there's a reason. In this doubt, in this chaos, it is not random, there is a very real reason. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, and then he lists one prophecy of many. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took his wife, that is also what you think it is, but knew her not until she had given birth to the son and called his name Jesus. So I want to pause on a few things because this is really, really, really important. 
the Old Testament, if I could summarize the Old Testament in like one phrase, it is we suck um, at following rules. That's like the Cliff Notes version to the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament is God saying, here's how you have a right relationship with me. And we're like, cool, we got this. Whatever you say, God, we got it. And then, ah, we blew it. Can we have another shot? And he's like, okay, one more. Don't blow it. Don't worry, God, we got this. Ah, I blew it. God, can we have a shot? Sure, one more. Grace to you, but don't blow it. I promise, God, right, I could do this for the next, you know, couple hundred years, and it'd be a pretty accurate of what is happening in the Old Testament. So you get to the point where that God and man are at kind of an impasse. They, they've kind of come to this stalemate of 400 years from the last book of the Old Testament till now, where God has basically said, you know what, enough with you. I, it's like an angry parent who says, I, I don't even know what to say right now. That, that's essentially what God says in, in the midst of it. He goes, you know what, I don't even know what to say. I, I'm so angry, I can't even speak. And so he doesn't for 400 years. And he just, and then magically we have this. We have the virgin birth out of seemingly nowhere. Where now people are all talking about this Mary got visited by an angel and Joseph did and all this and it's fulfilling the prophecy. It is now. And they're like, well, that that was generations ago. Yeah, but it's now. And so then we read and we're like, oh, the Holy Spirit, virgin birth. That's so cool. And oh, the baby. And and. Let's just pause for a minute, and let's, let's not blow by this virgin birth thing, okay? Um, because I don't know about you, um, it would be really hard for me to believe an angel in a dream. He gave Mary the benefit of the doubt. I don't think I would have. I mean, let's remember, this was a dream. I've had some crazy dreams, and I've never woken up and been like, yeah, let's roll, right? Like, I've never... Like, I, I, you know, I had this dream where it's like, you know what, I'm going to sell everything, and I'm going to move out into the big western plains. I'm going to go to Montana. I'm going to buy up all this land, and then I'm going to get into war with a bunch of people, and then to just kind of make sure I still have money, we're going to raise stallions. It's, oh, no, that was Yellowstone last night, right? Like, I'm like, oh, that was season four, and right, okay, my bad, right? So you have these crazy dreams, and never once, well, maybe you did. If you're a woman, you definitely did. You're like, hmm. My dream, right? And if, and if you're a dude and you're married to a woman, you've been in trouble for something you did in a dream. But it's, okay, you too, good. I did that. That was a test. And I was like, is it just me? Laughter confirms it is not. So, so things happen in dreams, right? But just because it was in a dream doesn't mean it's real. But Joseph is like, yeah, that seemed pretty real to me. Because God's message to him is what is in her is from me. And it speaks to the heart of God. And it speaks more to us than I think we'd like to admit. Because our first, if, if we are in the admission season here, the first thing that happens is we say, no, oh, that can't be, immediate doubt. But what God is saying is what is packaged as disappointment is actually my destiny. What is packaged as a broken promise is actually me working something out. What you see as an absolute failure is actually move, me moving some stuff around to, to, to advance your life and to get things in a different place. What you look at as just the worst news you could possibly have, it's okay. I'm working behind the scenes all the time. I'm always, always working. Now, in, in my translation, I, I read the ESV and I... So I've got a certain phrase here that I was looking for, and I don't know, forgot to check if there's another translation. Does anyone have a physical Bible that is not ESV? Anyone? Anyone in the house? Any person? My wife? Yes, NLT. All right, I'm going to walk away from the cameras because I need to check this. Okay, thank you. Is it bookmarked to Matthew? It is? Okay. Marriage series comes in February, everybody. Okay, hold on. I just, all right, because, so this is NLT. And look, it's teal. It's the Inspire Bible. Um, and it's, oh, you can like, is this like an adult coloring book Bible kind of situation? Yeah, it is. That's cool. Don't, I don't, hey, I don't know my wife's Bible, so whatever. We're both on the hook. Okay, let's see here. Just, okay. 
Mary, just she was born in Saint Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid. Take Mary. Okay, yeah. Okay. See, that's what I thought. In the NLT, it's not in there either. Uh, the angel never actually gives Joseph proof. Thank you for bringing your Bible. One point for you. <laughs> and it isn't in any other translation that you'll find. Nowhere does the angel give Joseph proof to battle his doubt. Never, not once. The other thing that happens is we don't ever hear in there what Joseph's emotional state is like. It's not considered. In his doubt, the angel does not address proof and does not address emotions, which, by the way, are the two things that you and I as humans need to move past doubt, or at least we think we need. I need proof to move past my doubt. I need a a better emotional state to get me past my doubt. He didn't get any of it. He didn't get any of it. Everything in his life, everything in that moment supported his doubt. All the evidence confirmed that he was in the right to doubt. And that doubt, if he wasn't careful, was going to lead him to a dead end. There was simply no way forward. This story is full of dead ends and no way forwards. The Old Testament ends in Malachi with a dead end and no way forward. The story begins with a group of people being introduced to us, Mary and Joseph, who are at a dead end with no way forward. And maybe you have found yourself in a season like that or your season is like that right now where you are at a dead end and you don't see a way forward. The divorce papers that were filed earlier this year or are sitting on the kitchen table seem like a dead end and there's no way forward. The addiction that you've been battling seems like a dead end and there's no way forward. The test result you got back is a dead end and there's no way forward. You extended forgiveness to someone and it didn't work out. You tried to reconcile and it didn't go as planned. Everything that you had as a hope and dream for your career or your relationships with your kids, with your parents, with your neighbors, with your friends, and it didn't work out seems like a dead end. Even... Religion sometimes can seem like a dead end. Maybe you've been in some way pursuing God as best you know how, but what you've actually been pursuing is religion, which is a list of rules that keeps you from moving forward. And you try and you try and you try, and as much as you white knuckle, you don't actually ever change, which is why you've had the same goals about reading your Bible and praying that you've had for the last 10 years, and nothing ever changes. And you're just in this dead end. And then heaven shows up, Matthew chapter 1, and announces this is not the end. Because what you have in mind and what you have planned is not what God has in store. You can't find it anywhere. I want to give you a definition of the doubt that I'm thinking about and what Joseph, I believe, was dealing with. It is this. It is a favorable judgment in the absence of full evidence. He gave the benefit of the doubt, not just the doubt itself. He gave the benefit of the doubt. He gave the benefit of the doubt to Mary. He gave the benefit of the doubt, ultimately, via the angel to God. He gave them a favorable judgment in the absence of full evidence. Because when it doesn't add up, the variable is always God. When you look around at your life and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. The variable, the thing that you have not yet considered is God. And what I would invite you to, and what Joseph demonstrates, and many all throughout the Gospels demonstrate, is verdict first, evidence second. Most of us, we do it in reverse. Right? We, we look at all the evidence, we look at our life and go, surely God isn't doing anything because if he was, my life wouldn't be such a mess. As if the only time God acts is when everything is going right for you, which sets up a very weird theological game that you've been playing, that when your life is going bad, then God is absent, and when your life is going good, that God is present. Therefore, your life is the litmus test of if God is real. That is a dangerous game that I would encourage you not to play. Rather, verdict first, God is good, 
God is here for me, for my hope, for my joy, for my best, for my fulfillment. Now I'm going to go look around my life and gather the evidence that that is real. Because I'll tell you what, life is full of evidence that will tell you God is here to punish you. This morning, when we walked in, well, long story short, I got a call last night from my friends at the Woodland Police Department, and they said, hey, Matt, are you at the church? And I said, no. And they said, is anyone supposed to be at the church? And I said, no. And they said, okay, well, your back door is open and your lights are on. We'll send the dog through. We'll walk, we'll walk the building, make sure everything's cool. I said, great, appreciate it, my friends. If you don't know, I also work for the Woodland Police Department. Good friends to have in a moment like that. And so they cased the building, sent the dog through, came back, and they're like, hey, man, we walked your building. Everything seems cool. We'll lock it up. You're good to go. I said, thanks, boys. Appreciate it. So we walked in this morning, looked around. Like, all right, cool. Let's roll. Until the band started getting ready. And Teddy goes, hey, did someone move my guitar? And my heart sunk. And we went back into that room and saw that they stole more than we could ever dream. Thousands of dollars of guitars and things that were given as gifts and presents. And I mean, just heartbreaking. Now, you could use that as evidence that God is not working and that God is going to not be a part of what we're doing here this morning and even in the church and it's some punishment for something we did. Or you could say, verdict first, God is good. We live in a broken and fallen world. This is a result of sin in this world and it is horrible and it is tragic, but God is good. We have insurance We'll get things replaced. Yeah, they're not the guitar that we were gifted on birthdays and anniversaries and things, but that's okay. It's just stuff. God is still good. God will still move. People will still show up, and we'll all worship God together. Evidence second, yeah. Verdict first, evidence second, because here's the assumption. The assumption is that faith is the absence of doubt. That's the assumption. If I have faith, I don't have doubt. Sorry, that's not the case. And you cannot read this book and prove that to me either. No, the the reality is faith is progress despite my doubt. And every character in this story proves that point. Everything in my life has shown me doubt. I'm going to choose progress. Everything in my life is choosing me to tell me God isn't good. I'm going to choose that God is good. And you just keep moving forward. It's funny, as a pastor... People ask me all the time, man, it must be so cool to be a pastor. What's it like to, like, have no doubt? <laughs> I don't know. I'll find you a guy. I don't like, as if the pitch is, as if they've read this book and the pitch is believe without a doubt, which that phrase isn't in here, by the way, but believe with no doubts. I'm sorry to tell you, as your pastor, I have my doubts. And I've read this book multiple times, and I have doubts. I mean, if you actually stop and think about it, and you read, my wife says this to, to uh, people a lot, that if you actually read this story and read what we actually believe, some of it's a little cuckoo, right? If I'm being honest, think about it. Don't just put on the child like, yeah, I'll believe anything. Think about it. God of the universe created man and woman, and then it wasn't working out. So he wrapped his godson, who was a spirit in flesh, sent him as a baby. He lived perfect, died on a cross, died, rose from the dead. Like, what? So I get it. It, You should have doubts. It makes sense. And if you're like, well, I need to find another church where the pastor doesn't have doubts, what you will find is a church that has a pastor who just hasn't told you yet. So if that makes you a little uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but it's the reality. Now, I've come to a different place with those doubts, and those doubts hang in my mind for mere seconds, not days, weeks, months, or years. Because even if, if, if faith was a prerequisite, and a lack of doubt was a prerequisite to move forward in the story, Mary never would have made it past chapter one. Because <clears throat> I want you to pay attention to this. If you have your Bible, which apparently is just my wife... Yeah, everything's a test, people. <clears throat> um, you could flip over or just wait until the texts do it. Um, 
<clears throat> to Luke chapter 1. So here's, here's what happens. An angel, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> an angel shows up to Mary and says, hey, Mary, God loves you. That's like his opening line. Hey, Mary, God loves you. And she goes, ah, and she's afraid. <clears throat> he says, no, 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 don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. But God has a plan for your life, and it's kind of crazy, so I want to let you in on it. And so he goes through the whole thing. Like, you're going to have a child of God, and you're going to name him Jesus. The, the very thing, almost word for word, that the angel says to Joseph in Matthew, the angel says to Mary in Luke. And so they have these like kind of parallel conversations. And so Mary is being kind of downloaded all the information from the angel. And this is Mary's response. Don't miss this. Luke chapter 1, verse 29. And Mary said to the angel, How? What? No, that's not. Oh, I quoted the wrong one. It should be, and we'll change it for next service, is Luke chapter 1, verse 34. I'll read it to you since you don't have your Bible, judgy, judgy, again. <laughs> Luke records that Mary said to the angel, how will this be? <clears throat> how are you going to pull that off? How? How's that going to work? Think about this. An angel of God visits Mary and says, this is God's plan. And she goes, how? How are you going to pull that off? Well, I'm a messenger from God. Oh, I know, but how? I don't, I don't see it. I don't understand it. Don't we all do that? When God's like, here's my promise, we're like, mm, but how? I'm going to provide for you. Mm, how? Need details. I'll see if it checks out. I will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah, but, but how exactly? By not leaving you. Yeah, but last week I didn't feel you close, so how? I need, I need more, God. I need proof. How, just so you know, is a dead-end question. How is a doubt question. When your mind goes to how, your mind is going to doubt. You're going, you are on your way to a dead end. That's what you're doing. All of them, they could have allowed their doubt to keep them in a dead end. And the story would have ended with a big, long Old Testament, a 400-year break, and then two chapters of Matthew, and that's your Bible. But they didn't. They gave God the benefit of the doubt, a favorable judgment and lack of full evidence. And what is the true benefit of the doubt to play on the words is to go through that process of wrestling, of saying, God, I don't know. God, I have my doubts. And he goes, I know, I know, just hold on. And he proves himself faithful. Joseph goes, God, I have my doubts. And he says, I know, hold on, hold on. There's a baby. It's, it's God. What? Mary, how are you going to pull that off? Two weeks later, whoa, right? I mean, just hold on. I, I think that's one of the biggest things that I could say all throughout Scripture that God would say to us is, give it a minute. Hold on. I've been doing this for millions of years. I know you got a big deal that needs to be done by Monday. Relax. I got this. <clears throat> if there's nothing else that you hear this morning, I want to tell you whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, whether you've been following him for 50 years or if you're just kicking the tires, not really sure what you believe, I want to tell you without fail, without doubt, emphatically, you can still doubt and follow Jesus at the same time. You can. You can doubt and still follow Jesus. You do not have to understand everything in order to believe something. One of the most <clears throat> beautiful stories in this regard comes out of Matthew 14. It's the Apostle Peter. And if you've been around church, maybe you've heard the story. He's in a boat and Jesus walks to him and calls him out to walk on water. And says, Peter, come. And so Peter's like, yeah, walk on water, let's do this thing, right? So he goes walking out on the water. And then, if you know the story, he gets his eyes caught on all the circumstances, and he falls. And Jesus reaches out his hand, and he picks him up. And the first words out of his mouth are, Peter, why did you doubt? <clears throat> and so many of us, when we read that story, hear that story, we think of this angry father <clears throat> saying, Peter! Shame on you. Why did you doubt? Not okay. And people will use that passage and others as evidence that God cannot withstand your doubt. 
You need to do away with all doubt before you make any step of faith. But they don't read a couple chapters later where they're standing on the shore. And Jesus basically looks back at him. It's later in Matthew and looks back at him and says, hey, man, so what was that doubt thing, that water thing about? Like, what happened there? Like, do you doubt or because I'm going here and I'd love you to follow me. But if you're having doubts and faith and you don't want to follow me, okay. But I'm going to go. I'm ultimately going to go die. Do you want to follow me? And I think Peter's response in Matthew chapter 14 is beautiful. What he says is, Jesus, where else are we going to go? Of course I'm going to follow you. Where else am I going to go, man? I've tried everything. I've put my faith in a political leader. I mean, Rome at the time was nothing to be trifled with. They put the U.S. to shame in that regard. It's like, I put my faith in them. We saw what they did to my friends. I put my faith in these ladies I met. That didn't really work out. I'm still single. Like, I put my faith in my career. We have it well documented that Peter's not very good at what he does. Not a phenomenal fisherman, even though he's been doing it for 25 years. He's terrible at it. Every time you come up on Peter, he's like, where's the fish? Right? <clears throat> so he's like, man, everything. I'm not good at anything. What else am I going to do, Jesus? I have this horrible life where I have no purpose, no future, and you come along and tell me that God has a purpose and a plan and a future for my life. So of course I'm going to follow you. Where else am I going to go? Where else am I going to go? I'm going to go to you. And if you've been following Jesus for a while, you know that. And you've had some seasons of doubt, and you've come to the place where you go, but where else am I going to go? I've tried everything. And not to say that these things aren't good, they're fine, but like I've tried therapy, I've tried talking to my friends, I've tried reading books, I've, try, I've tried everything. I'm back to you, Jesus. Where else am I going to go? Do not let doubt stop you. Whatever season of doubt you're in right now, do not let it stop you from moving forward in your faith. Do not let it stop you from moving forward in this story, this narrative that God is trying to write in your life. Do not let it stop you from making progress because Satan would love your doubt to stop you in your tracks. Do not let it. Do not let it. In this season, as we pause to celebrate the birth of Christ, recognize that Jesus was born into a world of doubt. Everyone around him doubted him right up until the day he died. And when he died, everyone left. He didn't have a friend in the world. Why? Because they all doubted. If you have your doubts, you are in good company. Because every single one of the men and women who have gone before us in faith all had their doubts as well. They just didn't let their doubt define their destiny. Let's pray. We'll sing together, light some candles, and have a beautiful moment of celebration before we leave for this year. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, in spite of our doubt, we trust you. In spite of our circumstance, we trust you. God, we thankful, we're so thankful for your faithfulness that has seen us through some of the most difficult seasons in life. Jesus, we love you. I pray for every person in this room that is dealing with any level of doubt, God, that they would see a way forward, that they would not stop in their doubt, that they would push through to faith, and that ultimately, that they would find and follow you. Jesus, we give these songs of worship and celebration to you now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to stand with us as we continue to worship this morning? Out of me, oh home. Home, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Rejoice. 
We're going to have the staff come up to the front of the room and we're going to have a candle lighting moment and just a really quick rundown so we don't have wax dripping all over everybody. We're going to light them. Matt, Fozzy, and Marge will be up in the front lighting them. If your candle is lit already, keep it straight and if you're lighting from somebody else, do it sideways <laughs> so we don't have, so just, yeah, just like that. And then we'll be able to worship together as we continue lighting candles.
or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens, there's shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. in our salvation that blessed Christmas morn one more song and we're just gonna sing silent night as a family so sing it out even if you feel like you can't sing we're just gonna sing it out together
much for coming, being a part of this. Um, be praying for you and your family through this season, for your doubts, for your faith. Uh, excited to kick off the new series in the new year, Real Change, to actually solidify some of those doubts, maybe, some of those things we've been talking about. So I know you're all grown men and women, but I'm going to teach you how to blow a candle out anyways. Um, put your hand, your other hand, the one that Aaron told you to clap with, and put it out. Put it out front. Yeah, you were like, put your hand. They were like, well. Um, so put it out and then blow into your own hand, not under the neck of the person in front of you. <laughs> Trust me, I've been, I've been a worship leader for a long I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen everything you can see with a candle. Um, so as we leave, we'll read the benediction together. As you exit that door, there's a Christmas paper wrapped box. You could just put your candle in there. We'd appreciate it. So let us read the benediction for the final time together this year. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful new year. We'll see you in the new year. God bless. Love you guys. Bye.